from two to three dimensions, especially with this amazing uh, architecture, which remains remain one of the most compelling and and and, and uh, also uh, difficult a part of the Supremacist contribution to uh, uh, the revolution in form. And what I retain as extremely important uh, is uh, the set of utopian cities, or theoretical cities. Uh, they might be utopian since they don't relate to particular places. Uh, they uh, can be related to a very much broader uh, fascination of uh, Russian radical culture for flying. And this is something you find in literature, in the poetry of Klebnikov, of course in the way in which Malevich legitimizes some of the shapes of his uh, paintings and drawings. This is also what uh, Lazar does. Uh, on the base of the view from the airplane, which is one of the big emerging themes in the uh, history of modernist culture. And uh, it's clear that uh, Hideker's projects float or fly somewhere from Malevich's Planiti, uh, which uh, are, I think, one of the most interesting moments in uh, Malevich's 1920s, work of the 1920s, and Friedman and other spatial cities. The idea that, the, uh, in a way, the ground, touching the ground corrupts uh, the uh, creative architecture that city can produce and that by freeing the city from the ground, which is almost a literal uh, illustration of the political uh, move that took place when the Soviet regime nationalized the ground, by breaking with the ground, a new, uh, a new world would be possible, new relationship in three dimensions, new aggregations within society. So I think that this aspect uh, of Hidekos, uh almost lifelong preoccupation is for me the most uh, uh, provocative today. Thank you. I'll just add to that that uh, Lazar Markovich taught uh, almost until uh, the end of his life in 1986. He was actually the longest surviving uh, of Malevich's disciples, so I think that one of the uh, uh, second longest is uh, somebody like Ivan Cherninko, who died in uh, around 1950 or so, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, and then somebody like Chashnik died in 1929, uh, tragically, and uh, Yudin, who was the same age as him, died in um, 1941 or so. So yeah, yeah. So a lot of a lot of uh, most of this generation didn't make it, and he really was the the the, the one who carried this sort of architectural torch, the supremacist torch, all the way to pretty much the perestroika and glasnost, and uh, very unique in that way, and uh, trained uh, uh, many generations of. Uh, uh, Soviet architects, of Russian architects in uh, Leningradsk, uh, um, Leningradsk Institute of Engineering and Construction or Engineering uh, and Construction Institute. It changed names about five times, but it's the same school where he went and uh, uh, was really was really a, a kind of a, a important figure, uh, not just uh, as an educator, but also as we know in terms of uh, his professional practice, uh, which, which was very prolific, uh, despite the kind of Stalinist uh, realism period, uh, but he built, uh, also he built a number of schools, not just one that you showed, but uh, there is many, many schools, yes, yeah, so the kind of the scale of this uh, practice and the scale of this, uh, of him as an educator uh, is really something what uh, actually requires quite a bit of further study. I just started looking at him uh, in, the, in the recent weeks for, for, for this event and realized that uh, there's really very little actually in that, uh, in that later period. So. <laughs> Just to add to that, uh, to go back to my notes, uh, Hidekel, Malevich, Jasnik, Yudin, they all had a dream, and that was the complete, complete innovation of society, of art, of architecture, based on the principle of suprematism. And that dream was within the context of a new utopia, a new proposal for a new world where the manipulation of space was different, the, uh, the new geometries were introduced and included in their works, and also the Hidekel managed to fuse art with architecture. And at the same time, in terms of, uh, of, rela of relating painting uh, and architecture, he managed to fuse materiality with non-material space and non-material world. And that's a unique contribution. And that at the same time, um, 
if you if you see his drawings and relate his drawings and his paintings with uh, his architectural works, uh, you could see this lack of gravity and the development of new forces. So practically, he experimented with uh, absent forces, existing forces, and gravity, no gravity, two-dimensionality, three-dimensionality, straight and curved lines, splitting lines, intersecting lines. So all, all information is there. It's all information related coming from the suprematism, and also all knowledge uh, coming from, uh, from contemporary avant-garde architecture. Axonometric drawings, isonometric drawings, and, and I guess that's, that's part of the beauty of it. And that's the part of the, of the beauty of the educational system at that, at that period, with a great emphasis on interdisciplinarity, which is, um, which is something that um, somehow was lost in the years. And there is this huge um, gap between painting and architecture in terms of communication, interaction, and intersection. Um, and I think that uh, just uh, while I was listening to Regina's uh, talk, I just thought that uh, what he really did is that he drew buildings and he built drawings. And that's, which I think, I think that's, that links, that bridges nicely suprematism with uh, his suprematist training, his uh, dedication to, uto to utopia with uh, practical architectural work. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm surrounded by historians and experts of suprematism and of Hideko, so I was thinking what to say. And I thought of, maybe you've seen it, the film Gravity. Sandra Bullock, and, uh, which shows us the world today, as hallowed sees it at least, but as popular culture, uh, of the apocalyptic, uh, the, the, the apocalyptic sense of, gra of, of lack of gravity, uh, the danger of exploration of space, uh, the catastrophic uh, aspects of the world as we see it today. Looking back at Heidegger, I mean, it's kind of a really, as I think about it, it's a privilege. It's, you know, you see something so fantastic, so breathtaking. I mean, even in these models, the copies of drawings, the things I've seen, it, it's just something that, that gives you goosebumps as an architect. And I'm not speaking as a, a historian here, although I have read a number of books by some of these eminent authors who are here. But what is it about uh, Hideko, about Siskiyar Malevich, about suprematism, about that whole period that is so beautifully described uh, in actually the autobiography of Chagall, uh, My Life, where he talks about really how it came out, kind of a spiritual sense. And I think of the Greeks, I think it was Heraclitus who said, if you don't expect the unexpected, uh, you will miss it. That's I, that's the exact quote, if you, uh, translation. If you don't expect the unexpected, you will, you, you will miss it. For it is hard to be sought and difficult to find. And I think that's the beauty of architecture here, as presented by great visionaries, great artists, great thinkers, just great sort of beings who really saw something so outstanding that has such an impact, I think, on architecture. And particularly what I love about Hideko, uh, which makes him really into a giant, and they were all giants, but he's a giant, because he didn't stop at the level of drawings and theory. He, he sort of created a work in the tension of what, I think in 1919, Einstein had, uh, said the following. He said, a theory has to be proven by observation. In the same year he said, the theory, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. So it, it reminds me really of this, this period of time that People were torn by this amazing new world that was opening with all its technological possibilities, the whole idea of the city, the idea of what art can do in its kind of pure form to change reality. And I think Heidegger is like one of these prophets. I, I cannot help but think of all of them, you know, with, with their, you know, the way they stand, the way they gesture, the way they look with their eyes into the future, where they came from, from the pale and those, those villages. And I think of, you know, what is missing in architecture today? Like what, what, what is, we have many architects, we have great visions, we have a discussion of cities, but I think several people, I think every one of you said it, it had also to do with education. It had to do with a kind of a transformed spirit because he was also a great student of great masters, but also himself a master. 
And I thought about it that today education through the internet is kind of universal. We all, you know, there's an access. So how is it possible? Is it possible to get great architecture without a dogma? It's a question. Is it possible to create a great world without a religious system? Is it possible to, in a kind of relativistic system, to create works which demand this kind of completely insane commitment across, uh, you know, totalitarian regimes, across uh, arrests and, and, and death of colleagues? How, how and it's a question. I don't think, and I think you said something beautiful. You said at one point you showed something. You said I really don't know. It, it's, it's. There is a, there is a, and I don't say this word uh, cheaply here. There is a mythical aspect here, because we cannot fully explain. We can talk about axonometric drawing. We can talk about the objective, art, but there is a. The work is infused in Heidegger, and as it is in, in my favorite others who are part of, part of this time. It's infused with a spiritual sense, whatever that means. We don't really, you know, how, how can we explain it? But it, it has that, and that's what I love about architecture. That's what I look, you know, when I look at architecture around, I, I look for it. It could be even architecture that is kind of ugly, not very well made, or even made in a very unexpected place or system that has that kind of spirit. And I think, to me, this, this is really an amazing, amazing work, and I hope that it gets, thanks to AIA and this institute, that it gets much more exposure because right now much of this work is a footnote in very fantastic books which are filed in somewhere. But I wish it was had a much more uh, dissemination because it would undermine so many notions of what is architecture, how it's produced, where does it come from, the relationship between drawing and building. And I have to say as an architect, I can see because once upon a time I only drew I had no commissions for many years. Really, my first building, you know, I was over, I think I was in my late 40s when I started my first building. And I understand that the, 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 the idea here of how do you go from something that is considered completely not practical, it cannot be really built, it's not believable by anyone, to something that is really architecture, space, and these fantastic ideas for a city. So I think there's a lot to be digested, really. I, you know, it's just a comment on how fantastic Hideko is and how inspiring, I think, to many architects. Even architects who may not share this formal language. Uh, and I just asked, shall we, whether Friedman, Jonah Friedman, knew these drawings, and he said probably not. But somewhere there is an impetus for such wild and at the same time very practical ideas that are kind of stunning. And by the way, I want to ask, where do the models come from? Uh, <laughs> these models actually uh, we produced a few years ago for the exhibition in Zurich. It's not original, but they are original models. Uh, you know, there are photographs from original models, uh, but uh, they are based on very precise drawings. Uh, and you can see this uh, um, uh, very horizontal architecture here. Yes, this one which we have, uh, I showed that. Uh, yeah, you see over there. Yeah, and this is uh, uh, the 22, 23. So it's basically, uh, he started this in Vitebsk and he really made these tunnels uh, for freight um, um, Graphic, you know, he was, he was, what uh, for me is very important in him, his humanity. It's just unbelievable how human he was. Because he lived in such a time when people really, these utopias, were so scared, actually. You know, you, you don't want to live in these houses with these boxes and uh, no, no access and, uh, you know, um, and go even by um, uh, very special schedule, like everyone is like, uh, you know, waiting, you know, going in the morning and, and, and and so on and so on and so on. He was absolutely out of this. So his idea was to elevate people, to save the world, to save the earth, to save the nature. And this was his main notion. This humanity is just unbelievable. And I think this is really, um, you know, spiritual, um, um, uh, something spirituality. I don't know what he maybe uh, got in his home, in his family, maybe of being Jewish, maybe of coming from the Jewish pale. I don't know where, you know, from 
from above because uh, he, he has, a, uh, you know, uh, like a poetry uh, that, that he was wandering around the city waiting for Messiah when he was small, you know. Finally, he met Malevich, he met his Messiah. But uh, he was always spiritual. It's very interesting. Can I ask you a question? How did he survive through the through those years? How did he survive? By accident? Very carefully. Uh, you know, he survived by a few reasons. First, Stalin didn't kill architects. He needed them. But he, who really he he killed, he lived theoreticians, right. a few. Uh, he uh, the philosophers, the philosophers, yeah, he didn't, he, he didn't, uh, didn't need and them, but he didn't kill any architect because he needed them. Uh, and what is interesting is that uh, before the war, when war started, in 10 days after war started, he was already in Sverlovsk, in Ural, building plans for heavy machinery. And, uh, you know, little secret, he will be presented at the uh, Venetian Biennale this year with his very unexpected project from this time. Huh. No, it, it's true that the architectural profession behaved itself in respect to others. They, they were not cross denunciations. Even people, for instance, paradoxically, uh, avant-garde uh, architects who were extremely exposed and had been criticized very vibrantly during the 30s uh, were protected by uh, people from the old guard. Joltovsky protected uh, Leonidov. and completely unexpected. So the architectural profession, uh, and not because it was useful, because generals were useful, because engineers were useful, lots of useful, supposedly useful people were, were exterminated. Um, no, uh, I want to say one, one additional thing. Uh, we have this uh, color xeroxes of the uh, drawings on the wall. Uh, what uh, has been left by Hidekel is an extraordinary uh, graphic archive. And I want to, to underline the paradoxical fact that today the surviving buildings of the avant-garde are all threatened. They're vanishing. The house of Melikov is uh, now falling, sinking into the ground because of faulty uh, foundation works of the nearby buildings. Uh, the Narcomfin communal house by Gittsburg is being uh, virtually, virtually uh, annihilated by uh, cynical renovation. When buildings like the communal house of Nikolaev is supposedly restored, everything is demolished and rebuilt with new materials. Mm -hmm. And finally, the absolute masterpiece of the of civil engineering that year, the uh, uh, tower by Vladimir Shukov in Moscow, uh, sh should be, if nothing uh, prevents it, replaced by a skyscraper in the coming times. So what will remain of the Russian avant-garde will, will, will not be a set of buildings. They are vanishing under our eyes for reasons that are related to uh, uh, the uh, savage uh, real estate speculation in Moscow, but also for all sorts of reasons. Because these buildings represent communism, and also because they are understood as being un-Russian, as being Tsujie, as being uh, Jewish. So I think that preserving the graphic archive of someone like uh, Hidekel uh, will save at least something when all the buildings will be gone. Yeah. I would just add to that because I'm sort of also in the midst of this Dokomoma discussion about the Shukov Tower. Uh, one of the recent remarks by the city architect was, well, uh, it is a standardized construction. It should be uh, able, to, one should be able to uh, disassemble and assemble it in a different place. So I thought that was a kind of uh, the, the stone on the grave of this as well. But just, uh, I'll just uh, add one, one small thing about this question about how did he survive and, and uh, uh, the sort of uh, heritage of, of uh, avant-garde. So even um, even uh, in the in the 60s, as uh, Hidekel experienced uh, this renewed interest to his suprematist past, he still, uh, according to his students, was sort of very uh, careful to bring up suprematism in uh, in his in his teaching openly, but admitted to being a formalist. 
although with a kind of uh, clarification, he said a visionary formalist, a visionary formalist, which, is, which I thought was a very beautiful way to, to, uh, to do this. Yeah. You know, we have so many um, um, really um, memories from the student, and recently I received one uh, who told me, I remember 61, we were going with Lazar Hibigal, and he asked me very intimately, do you like suprematism? <laughs> and he said, I have no idea about suprematism, but the question was like about our relative, you know, something like that, very warm. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, you know, we can talk about this uh, pretty much because uh, the, uh, he survived because he isolated himself from uh, uh, everything which could harm him, basically. So he was uh, also, he had, uh, in 1936, he was very young architect, and it was a uh, big uh, um, uh, assembly, you know, in the house of architect, uh, asking him about his formalism. Uh, and it was very dangerous because he could go to jail right now from there, you know, he's 36 already. And he actually was very, uh, um, clever, very smart, but at the same time he said, you know what, you say that uh, we copy West? No, West copied us, because my uh, late teacher Malevich, he was creating part that was really uh, copied by the Westerns. So it came, from, uh, it came from us, and they said, oh, really? So it came from us, okay. You know, so sometimes like a war can save it. You know, we have to go back to our uh, questions and also maybe take some questions from the public because we are late. So uh, the first question was that Lazar Hidical believed that the avant-garde architecture stylistically was a derivative from the avant-garde painting the most advanced media of the time. It was based on his own experience as a suprematist artist who was responsible for transition and so on. In his practice, philosophy and teaching, he proceeded from the primacy of imaginative vision and outgoing uh, secondary function, which he believed would express itself in the image if the image is correct. This is what I've heard from all of his students. So, well, I think I think imagination and form. I mean, these are words that we hardly can understand. We use them very loosely. Some, you know, imagination or form. But what is really form, and why was why is formalism in general discredited around the world? The word formalism is uh, is is not a good word. Anybody who's called a formalist in whatever system today is. But I think it is through the belief in form. And I think this is what what perplexes me, that a Malevich painting must sell for some millions of dollars, whereas buildings of Heidekel and others are threatened by destruction. So there is a split in the world of appreciating art. You know, the black square, the white square, the white on white. I mean, the, the fantastic exhibitions in, in the world. And the appreciation of architecture, which was actually the genesis, in some ways, of our appreciation of those paintings. It's not the other way around. It's not that Malevich created Hidekel. I think it's the other way around. Hidekel, uh, Lisitsky, those who tried to realize the vision it had a reflection on the world of those uh, squares and two-dimensional works that, that we so admire a lot. So to me, it's, it's, it, it, it's a fantastic exemplar of a really uh, both the sense of the spiritual and art, but I don't mean it in terms of the fourth, the fifth dimension or something like that, the, the, the love for what, uh, what a square really is. And I think it was Paul Valéry uh, in an essay in the 1920s on the end of Western culture, he said, the Western culture, and this was in the 20s, late 20s, he said, has, or maybe in early 30s, he says, has come to an end because no one can draw a line or a square with, with and love it, you know, it's, and not with computer technology. You know, we can draw a million squares, you know, without ever drawing them. You know, there is just a function. So how does the love for drawing, which came from a, a sense not of poverty, although it was also came from, you know, not from a luxury world, but from a, from ascetic, 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 Exercise. It was. It was people who deliberately denied themselves uh, many luxuries, uh, formally and, and in other ways, and created a world out of this 
this uh, innocence or solitude or or God, I don't know what, what you know, whatever Malevich called it. And, and there's such a disconnection between the words because when you read Malevich, when I read it, sometimes it sounds just like insane, like you can't believe that this is. As, but when you look at the works, you 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 become a believer. You know, whatever they said, it's verified truly in the works. So that's kind of the mystery and, and the enigma of great art. You know, it comes from a theoretical source and. It, and but I just want to say that, that I think it's very important for, not just for architects, but culture. And I think you said it, that the appreciation of this period. Why would anybody think this was a commun this was considered communist in, in to, today? It's really I think we're raising major, major issues that we, are, we will be unable to, uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, discuss fully today. Just one footnote to formalists, don't for, let's not forget that there was a scholarly grounded and scientific approach to formalism, precisely the one of Roman Jakobson and of the uh, Russian, uh, Russian uh, Shlovsky and other linguists, which uh, explored in, uh, in, in, in the poetic text and in literature problems that the artists were exploring in, uh, in space. We have time for two questions and two questions only. Just if, uh, if there's anyone in the up front, if not, Mark, I think I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. Uh, sorry, good. Yeah, for those who are coming late, by the way, uh, apologies. Uh, we have a double dinner tonight, first time ever, maybe the last time. And uh, the concept of having two programs on the same evening was how to cram even more than a thousand programs into this room. Uh, I think it works, but uh, that remains to be seen. Everybody here is welcome to say. People who are arriving can sign in to the table down here. But uh, the discussion will continue uh, with the conclusion by Mark and Roman, uh, uh, and uh, with a, maybe a 15-minute intermission with the bar open. I'll uh, say again that there's great vodka at the bar. Uh, we should have had some here. I apologize. And uh, the discussion's been fantastic, you know, because it talks again not only about the drawings that were left behind, but how it relates to contemporary scene. And I thank all of you for the observations that came from this panel and this presentation. Uh, Mark or Roman, do you want to write that? I think uh, we have not any time, uh, but uh, we have many questions. And, uh, thank you for coming. And this is really uh, one hundred and ten years my father. So, he will be very happy uh, now, and I think he saw us from <laughs> So, thank you for your appreciation. Thank you very much.